Welcome, everyone, to Litigation Nation. I'm your host, Jack Sanker. Our top stories, PACER, paywalls, not much longer, according to bipartisan legislation from the U.S. Senate, and a significant COVID-19 ruling out of Chicago, which could pave the way for a potential deluge of negligent COVID transmission or negligent infection civil claims. And is litigation financing to blame for the increase of high dollar verdicts and tort claims? All of that and more. Here's what you need to know. We'll start with some good news. Free Pacer. Yeah, that's right. The public access to court electronic records or PACER may be free to use for the public sometime in the near future. The Senate Judiciary Committee advanced the Open Courts Act of 2021 out of committee last week. The bill, sponsored by Senators Rob Portman, Republican, and Ron Wyden, a Democrat, co-sponsored by Senators Josh Hawley, Republican, and Dick Durbin, Democrat, would make the PACER system, which is used to access federal court documents online, free to use. The bill also aims to modernize the document access and lookup capacities of PACER. Senator Durbin, speaking on the Open Courts Act, said, quote, Presently, litigants in federal court and members of the public have to pay to get access to public federal court records, like filings and briefs, through the Public Access to Court Electric Records, or PACER system. Big law firms have no problem, but these fees may be too expensive for individuals, small businesses, small law firms, and nonprofits to track litigation that impacts them. And for some low-income individuals, the cost of accessing records can be so high that it may prevent them from going forward with a meritorious lawsuit. The PACER system is not keeping pace with reality or technology. I believe that this bill improves access to justice by eliminating the PACER paywall, end quote. According to the Senate Judiciary website, the PACER system costs the American public about $140 million per year in usage fees. And something like that, I think we should all be able to get behind. Anytime you can eliminate a paywall, that's fine by me. Uh, we'll keep an eye on this as it goes forward to a vote. Now, some bad news. A big law firm in New York's holiday party turned into a bit of a super spreader event for COVID. The firm, whose name I won't mention because there's no need to pile on at this point, uh, held an in-person party for the first week of December. According to Above the Law, which cites a few anonymous tipsters, up, upwards of about 10 associates have since tested positive following the event. And that is significant because, again, according to Above the Law, the firm had a mandatory vaccination policy in place. The firm offered to send home COVID tests to anyone worried, and anyone who tested positive was instructed to stay home for an extra 10 days after they test negative. The firm also encouraged people to take preemptive tests, quarantine the works uh, in a statement from its HR department. As a result of this, the firm has canceled all other holiday parties, which may be the start of a larger trend industry-wide. For example... A number of financial institutions have canceled their holiday parties in recent weeks, including Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan. And while most law firms probably won't put out statements the way that banks will, I can tell you anecdotally, at least, that in the Chicago legal community, the holiday party scene used to be three to four nights a week, uh, all through December and even January. And I can tell you that this year, a lot of lawyers I know will probably bill more hours in December than they have in years past. Um, all this goes to show that, however exhausted we all are of COVID, the Omicron variant has scared business owners and managers enough to cancel probably the one work party that people actually look forward to. Speaking of COVID, and I swear that this show will not just be a COVID show. Uh, but this is important news for those of us that work in tort litigation and in the coverage world. A Cook County judge just ruled on an issue that, depending on the outcome, could potentially pry open the door for a potential flood of COVID tort litigation, at least in my opinion. Uh, this is from the Chicago Daily Law Bolton. A Cook County Circuit Court judge refused to dismiss a lawsuit against a contractor accused of infecting a man who died of COVID-19. Uh, who was an employee of another company present on a construction job site. Specifically, Judge Cleary determined that the defendants, who may not have even had interlocking contractual relationships between each other, owed to the decedent a duty of care to protect against the virus generally. In general, the allegations were that the defendants failed to sterilize and clean work areas, implement social distancing, 
implement mass mandates. You can imagine the rest. Uh, importantly for this case, though, the infection took place sometime in March or April of 2020, basically when the virus was just becoming known and lockdowns were just starting. Nonetheless, Judge Cleary ruled that the contraction of the virus was, quote, highly foreseeable, which gave rise to duties owed by other contractors that shared the space with the decedent. And at this point, though I'm not a journalist, I should disclose that I am involved in COVID cases. So my editorializing on this case will probably come with my own spin. Uh, but one of the issues raised by the defendants in this case was the fact that in March and April of 2020, in particular, no one really knew what the heck was happening. Uh, the ruling, if it stands, seemed to indicate that businesses and other private actors may get the detriment of hindsight when their conduct during the first few weeks of the pandemic is brought up in subsequent lawsuits. Uh, was it really the standard that everyone on a construction site should wear masks and say, March 15th of 2020? Or is that applying the lessons we've learned since retroactively? Likewise, was it really standard practice in early March that surfaces and construction sites be sanitized regularly? In any event, if this is the rule adopted going forward, you can see how it makes it a lot easier for a plaintiff who got COVID to move forward with a lawsuit against, well, anyone that he or she decides to name in a suit. There's an interesting report out of the Claims Journal this week on litigation financing and how that may play a role in the nationwide trend of higher and higher verdicts in certain sectors, specifically in the tort litigation, mass tort, products liability, toxic tort, etc. cetera. Uh, according to the journal, which is citing to a report entitled U.S. Litigation Funding and Social Inflation by the insurance company Swiss Re. The United States is the largest third-party litigation funding market, accounting for all, over half of all litigation funding activity in the world. This report also tracks the number of verdicts over $5 million over the past year to two years, showing a general increase of about 10%. Median awards are going up as well. As an aside, for those of you that aren't familiar Litigation financing can come in many forms. Generally, the borrowers are, borrowers are either individual plaintiffs looking to get some income while their personal, personal injury lawsuit is pending. Uh, they could be law firms in mass tort or products cases that are seeking funding for, say, experts or other litigation expenses, or sometimes they're just corporate plaintiffs directly. And I may be oversimplifying a bit, but basically lit the litigation finance options for a lawsuit can function in a similar way that venture capital money functions for a startup, investors lend money in return for an interest in the outcome. Uh, the interest rate on a loan is usually capped by statute, but can be pretty high. In Illinois, I believe it's over 30% annually. Uh, anyways, uh, the report claims that the impact of litigation financing may be driving verdict ranges higher and higher. The Swiss report calls this phenomenon, quote, social inflation based on the premise that the existence of third-party funding options, quote, incentivizes litigants to initiate and prolong lawsuits, which drives up insurance premiums. Basically, the argument, from what I can tell at least, is that with funding readily available, plaintiffs are able to stay in the fight longer, and as such, verdicts are going up. Generally, such loans are marketed as a way to facilitate access to justice to low-income plaintiffs, but on that point, the Swiss report claims Quote, if the goal is to enhance access to justice to underserved demographics, such as low-income individuals, TPLF, which is third-party legal funding, is an expensive and blunt tool. When a victim's only recourse for pursuing a meritorious claim through the courts is a high-interest loan from wealthy investors, it probably does not enhance access to justice significantly and creates a consumer protection problem. To advocate justice without burdening plaintiffs, businesses, and consumers with high litigation costs, expanding the funding and scope of legal aid funds, such as the U.S. Legal Services Corporation, can be considered. That's right. Business owners, if you want to lower your litigation expenses, maybe try sponsoring a legal aid clinic. So the central claim of the report that access to funding might be driving up verdicts seems to pass a sniff test. People settle or take short money for a lot of reasons, but a prolonged period with no income is a pretty common one. So with litigation financing becoming more common, it follows that there will be less early money or short money settlements. 
The second claim, however, that businesses should sponsor legal aid clinics to dissuade people from using third party financing options is a bit um, funny, in my opinion. It's kind of admitting that it's not a fair fight in most cases. But one of the things that litigation financing probably does do is create another mouth to feed out of the verdict or settlement because someone else is getting a slice of the pie. The plaintiff is pressured to grow the pie, so to speak. I don't know. Either way, it feels like litigation finance is only going to get bigger and bigger on the domestic scene. Uh, it'll probably be something that we keep a close eye on going forward. All right, folks, there it is. The first episode's in the books. I hope to get a lot better at this with practice. As you can tell, we'll be working out kinks with the show, but I think it has promise. On the format, this is it. 20 minutes or so where I give, where I get the opportunity to tell you about the highlights of the week. I'll mostly stick to civil litigation because that's my background. I will likely from time to time talk about a SCOTUS case here and there, but there's other shows that do that better than I can. So that's not going to be like our thing. The show is meant to keep you up to speed on some of the bigger happenings in the legal community that busy people don't have the time to read about. So much like I say when I'm talking to clients, I can't promise anything in terms of outcome, only in terms of process. All right, with that, I'll see you all next week.